Good morning, good morning, and uh, happy Sabbath, and welcome to our Bible study. Our lesson today is titled, Light in the Sanctuary. We are going to study about light, Jesus Christ, in the sanctuary, the intercession of Jesus Christ in the sanctuary for us. So what is the sanctuary? The heavenly sanctuary in the Bible is defined as God's dwelling place, where God's presence is manifested. On earth, we call it the tabernacle or the temple. We are told in the Bible that the earthly sanctuary that Moses built is an exact copy given by God to him at Mount Sinai. So, so when we look at the picture of the earthly sanctuary, we know how the heavenly sanctuary looks like. So the first uh, slide I'm going to read to you is, is uh, in Hebrews chapter 8, verse 5 and 6, telling us about the earthly sanctuary being an exact copy of the heavenly sanctuary. Let's read. Who the priests serve unto the example and shadow of the heavenly things, as Moses was admonished of God when he was about to make the tabernacle, God said to him, See, that thou make all things according to the pattern of the heavenly sanctuary, showed to thee in the mount, mountains, mount, means Mount Sinai. And now had he, Jesus, obtained a more excellent ministry, and how much also he is the mediator of a better covenant, which was established upon a better promise. So Jesus is our mediator of the second uh, covenant, the new covenant in the heavenly sanctuary. So our lesson today starts with telling us about the cleansing of the sanctuary. So let's look at the second text. It says, Un and God says unto Daniel, unto 2,300 days, then the sanctuary be cleansed. So here is God is telling uh, Daniel, there's a prophecy, it's called a 2,300 day prophecy. And that after this prophecy is over, the sanctuary will be cleansed. So what does that mean? So to understand this prophecy, let's go to Daniel chapter 12. Uh, sorry, Daniel chapter 8. Daniel chapter 8 begins with first telling us that Daniel has a vision. And it projects him forward to the city of Susa. What God is trying to tell Daniel is, I'm going to tell you the future. You see, Daniel lives here. During the time, <clears throat> excuse me, time of Babylon, God is projecting him to Middle Persia uh, 100, 150 years later. Susa is a very uh, one, a beautiful place. Susa means lily, and it's a city of lily, Susa. And this is the place of the residence of the king of Persia, the capital. Persia. And then God continued to tell Daniel more about Middle Persia. This is uh, the middle part of Daniel chapter 8. God shows uh, Daniel a ram with two horns. Horns are weapons of offense and defense. Horns are the power. So God is showing Daniel, a ram with two horns, and a goat with one horn. And then, in verse 5 of Daniel 8, God told Daniel that the goat is going to destroy the ram. After the ram was destroyed, the goat was also cast down. It means the goat died. And after the goat died, four horns come up, four and this is the four generals that came after Alexander died. The, the kingdom is divided into four kingdoms. 
So what is God telling Daniel? God is telling Daniel, after Babylon, there is Middle Persia, uh, a ram with two horns, Middle Persia. And then after Middle Persia, there is Greece. And Greece is going to destroy Middle Persia. And after the destruction of Middle Persia, the goat was cast down. That means Alexander the Great, who was the king of Greece, died. He died very young, 32 years old. And then after he died, what happened? Four horns came up. His kingdom was divided into four divisions, four generals. And then after that, a little horn come up. And who is this little horn? The Bible said he will take away the daily sacrifice, cast the place of the sanctuary to the ground. So this little horn is going to take away the sacrifice of Jesus, the, the work of Jesus, and destroy the work of the sanctuary. So this little horn is actually the papal power who starts to forgive sins, starts to uh, give grace. And so what God is telling Daniel is that this 2,300 day prophecy includes the rise and fall of nations, Middle Persia, Greece, Rome, and then the rise of the papal Rome, the little horn, which is going to take away the work of Jesus Christ. So now we have a little idea what the 2300 day prophecy involved all this nation and it involved the dark ages, the time when the church hated by the Pope who will start to do the work of Christ by forgiving sins, by giving grace, the work of the little horn that is going to destroy the work of Jesus Christ. So we have a little idea now what is 2,300 day prophecy. So let's go. go. And in slide number three, we are told that 2,300 days is actually 2,300 years. Because in prophecy, one day is equals to one year. Let's read. And when you have completed them, lie again on your right side, then you shall bear the iniquity of the house of Judah forty days. I have laid on you a day for each year. So now we, we are told that the 2300 day prophecy is actually 2300 days. 2300 days is the longest prophecy in the Bible. And, and, and we are told that after 2300 days, a sanctuary will be cleansed. Now Daniel is very confused. And at the end of chapter 8, what did Daniel do? He was sick. He couldn't sleep. He, he, he was fainted. He fainted. He was troubled. He did not understand. So he prayed to God. <clears throat> and God told Daniel to shut up the vision. It means put it aside. For it shall be for many days. It means do not worry about Daniel. This vision is for the end time, in the future. Don't worry about it. Daniel is still troubled. And Daniel is, is uh, wants to find out what is this uh, prophecy. So let's go to Daniel chapter 9. And Daniel chapter 9 tells us that Daniel starts to pray. He starts to profess the sins of, of Israel, confess the sins of Israel. And ask God to tell him about the uh, the prophecy. And we know that uh, Daniel, it says, is a student of the prophecy of Jeremiah. And Jeremiah prophesied that Daniel will be Daniel and Israel will be in Babylon only for seventy years. And now the seventy years is almost up, and so Daniel is also praying for delivery for, and confessing the sins of Israel. After he prayed, what happened? 
God sent Gabriel to tell him about this prophecy. But God first tell him another prophecy. 2,300, no, the, the Another prophecy, in addition to the 2,300-day prophecy, God tell Daniel, 70-week prophecy. You see, 70 week is actually 490 days, 7 times 7. And 490 days is 490 years. So if I show you, a, 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 this is the 2,300-day prophecy, this is the beginning of the prophecy, and God is telling Daniel, 400, the 70 week prophecy here, 470 weeks is 490 years. After 70 weeks, what happened? The Messiah will come, and, and he will make an end to sin. And so God is telling Daniel, Daniel lives here. 600 years before Jesus. So God is tell, telling Daniel, after you go back to Jerusalem, 490 years later, the Messiah will come. He will come and he will end, make an end to sin. He will come and forgive our sins. He, so, Jesus, so God is giving Daniel the vision of Jesus' mission. And then... Slide number four tells us that 70 weeks are determined upon thy people to make an end to sin and to anoint the most holy. This is talking about Jesus coming. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince will be seven weeks, three scores and two weeks. So here God is telling Daniel, that from here to here will be 69 weeks plus the, the last week of Jesus' life will be 70 weeks. Jesus will come. 70 weeks is 490 years. And that the beginning of the 2,300 and the beginning of the 2,300 years prophecy is when the king of Persia gave them a decree to rebuild Jerusalem. So the decree starts at 457 BC, and after 490 years, Jesus will come. One, and then after 2,300 years, the sanctuary will be cleansed. So let's let's go and understand what is the cleansing of the sanctuary. So if you look at the diagram in slide number five, you can see uh, the diagram that. From A, at the bottom you see A to C. A to C is the 70 week prophecy of the 490 years. It's the prophecy that God is telling Daniel about the coming of Jesus and the crucifixion of Jesus. And, and if you add 2,300 years to minus 457 BC, the beginning of the, you have 1844 which is the time, which will be the time of the cleansing of the sanctuary. So let's, let's look at slide number six. How do you get 1844? The 457 BC, BC is minus before Christ. 457 minus for 200, and uh, this is slide number six, 20, 300, you have 1844. So what happened in 1844? What is the cleansing of the sanctuary? You know, if we go back to uh, Leviticus uh, 16, it tells us that during the time of Moses, once every year is the Day of Atonement. A Day of Atonement is called Yom Kippur. It's the day the high priest goes into the most holy place in the sanctuary and asks for forgiveness for all the sins that is confessed to the sanctuary. Every day during the year, everybody go and they, 
they sacrifice an animal and they confess their sin, a daily sacrifice, and all the sins is transferred to the sanctuary. Once a year, on the Day of Atonement, the priests will go into the sanctuary and then go into the most holy place before the throne of God and confess all the sins <clears throat> so as to cleanse the sanctuary of sin, to cleanse Israel, so the people will be again reconciled with God, to make atonement with God. So the cleansing of the sanctuary is actually making, uh, taking our sins before God and, re and asking for forgiveness. So, so we go back to, uh, to go back to the 2300 day prophecy that in 1844, this cleansing of the sanctuary, the forgiving our sins begins after 1844. This is 1844. This part here is the cleansing of the sanctuary and then Jesus will come after the cleansing of the sanctuary. So, so what, what, what is happening at, at this cleansing of the sanctuary? You remember in 1844, there's no more sanctuary on earth. Jerusalem has been destroyed by the, the Roman Emperor Titus in uh, AD 70. The temple has been destroyed. So what Daniel is talking about is the cleansing of the heavenly sanctuary. What, what is Jesus doing in the heavenly sanctuary? Let's look at slide number eight. Let me read slide number eight. It says, Wherefore he is able to save us to the utmost that come unto God by him, seeing he, Jesus, ever lived to make intercession for us. For such an high priest, who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners. He's made higher than the heavens. So here, this text is telling us what Jesus is doing for us. He's interceding for us before God. He's our high priest in heaven. So cleansing of the sanctuary is Jesus presenting all our sins that we confess to him, to God, for God to cleanse our sins to block it out. So, so we are told in the book of uh, Daniel chapter 8 that this cleansing of the sanctuary is Jesus going before God to block out our sins. But we also learn about a person called William Miller. You know, in 1844 and 10, 20 years before, William Miller was an American Baptist minister, a farmer from New York, a scholar of the Daniel Book of Daniel. He started preaching to a lot of people saying that the cleansing of the sanctuary is the cleansing of the wall. He was mistaken. Because he says the cleansing of the wall is Jesus is going to come and cleanse the wall. So a lot of people believe him and sold all their possessions. And we get the great disappointment because cleansing of the sanctuary is not cleansing the wall. Jesus did not come. Cleansing of the sanctuary is actually cleansing the sanctuary of all our sins that we confess to Jesus. Jesus, as our mediator, goes into the holy place and confess all our sins to God. So, so, so we understand that after 1844, the cleansing of the sanctuary is actually our judgment. That Jesus is going to invest, to go and examine our sins and then forgive our sins, bring it to God, and after the cleansing of the sanctuary, then Jesus will come. So, so, so remember, cleansing the sanctuary is 
the removal of our sins from the sanctuary by Jesus uh, after 1844. Remember, uh, on the Day of Atonement during Moses' time, if anyone still harbors sin and did not confess their sins, they will be cut off from Israel. They will be banished. They will be lost. So we are now living in a time of examination and we have to to live to remember to confess our sins live our life of uh, repentance so that when jesus come we won't be cut off so the, the so the, the the cleansing of the sanctuary is actually the removal of our sin that we confess to jesus now, what, what, what does Jesus do when Jesus cleanses our sins in heaven? It's actually a kind of judgment. Jesus is opening the books and judging our life to cleanse us before he comes and give us reward. So let's look at slide number eight. Slide number eight says, there is a judgment. God will bring every deed into judgment, including what is in your heart, every he, hidden thing, good or evil. We are all going to face judgment. And the judgment is now. In heaven now. Jesus is judging us. And what did, what did uh, John saw in his vision about judgment? Let's continue to read. John said, I saw the dead great and small, standing before the throne. See, this is symbolic. John is seeing judgment. And it says here, the books are open. So the books, there are two books are open. And another book. So you notice that there are three books. What are these three books? One is the book of life. And the second one is the judge. The dead will judge according to what they have done. Second one is the book of works. So remember, there's a book of life and there's a book of works. And what is the third book? In Malachi chapter 3 verse 16 tells us that there's a book of remembrance. So remember, there's three books that God will judge us during this time of the cleansing of the temple to judge us to forgive our sins before Jesus come. So let's read again uh, the three books. Let's look at slide number nine. Slide number nine tells us we have the book of life. What is this book of life? This book of life have the names of those who are considered righteous, faithful, those who have overcome. So if you and I believe in Jesus Christ and we confess our faith and we are baptized, all our name will be written in the book of life. We are considered righteous and faithful. So Daniel chapter 12 says that all of us whose name are written in the book of life shall be delivered, means shall be saved when Jesus comes. So make sure your life, your name is in the book of life. Okay. Now what is the book of works? Revelation 20 says that God is going to judge us according to what we have done. So let's look at slide number 11 and read about what is the book of works. Here, books of work is not judging us only for what we have done to judge our motive. So if you read 1 Corinthians 4 to 5, it says, Therefore judge nothing before the appointed time. Wait until the Lord has come. Let God be the judge. We are the judge. He will bring to light what is hidden in darkness and will expose the motive of your heart. So here God is judging what we do, not only what we do, but what is in our heart. Sometimes when we do something, we do it for our own selfish gain, for people's praise, for our glorification. 
So the judgment here is God is judging our work according to the sincerity of our heart. God sees our heart. So remember, God will judge our heart and our motive. So that's the second book, Book of Life, Book of Works. And the third book is the Book of Remembrance. This is found in Malachi 16. And this book is is a scroll of remembrance concerning those of us who fear God, who honor God, and all who serve God. God, God is recalling all the good things we, we, we serve God. Mrs. White, one of our leaders, says that the record will contain the good deeds of the righteous. You see, God doesn't record our evil deeds. He's ready to forgive us and block out our sins. This is to record the good deeds. You know, some, some people die as a martyr. Some people do a lot of works of love. Some people serve God all their lives. So all these good deeds will be recorded and will be judged. So remember, God will judge you by three books. Book of Life, Book of Works, and the motive behind your works. And finally, the good deeds that you have done for God, the book of uh, remembrance. So judgment is actually, uh, judgment is investigation of the books. And it's to prepare you to receive the rewards of heaven. You know, and Jesus at the same time will be cleansing you by blocking out your sins. And and this is, this. This is uh, written in Acts chapter 3, verse 19. It says, you know, what you and I have to do is we have to repent for the forgiveness of sin. We have to live a life of repentance every day. We ask God for forgiveness every day and repent. So that, this is Acts three nineteen. so that God will block out our sins and prepare us for the day of refreshing. The day of refreshing is when Jesus come and give us new life, refreshing, cover us with his righteousness. So imagine, uh, our judgment includes Jesus blocking out our sins. So our next text is Paul telling us who will not be in heaven. Slide number 12. First Corinthians 6, 9 to 10 says, Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of heaven. Be not deceived. Neither fornicators, idolaters, adulterers, even effeminate, nor, nor abuses of themselves and mankind. And who else? Verse 10 says, no thieves, no covetous. The word covetous is you wanting something that doesn't belong to you. You covet your neighbor's things, his wife. So be careful. Covetousness means you love something more than you love God. You would not be in heaven because covetousness is is when you have things that you love more than God, you have idols. It could be money, it could be fame. So do not be covetous. And drunkards and revelers and extortioners, dishonest people shall not inherit the kingdom. So here Paul is saying that that uh, be careful to get your sins forgiven. Uh, live a life of repentance. Walk closely with God and try to not have those sins that keeps you from heaven. And then let's look at the next slide, slide number 13. Slide number 13 tells us that uh, we are very afraid that God is punishing us because we are unrighteous. Let's read slide number 13. 
But if our unrighteousness bring out God's righteousness more clearly, what shall we say? That God is unjust in bringing his wrath on us? What this verse uh, 5 saying is, I'm thinking as a human being, and I'm thinking that we are unrighteous, and God is righteous, so it is not unjust for God to punish us. So people believe that when, when we do wrong, God is going to punish us. Now, and Paul in verse 6 says, certainly not. God doesn't punish you when you do evil right now. No. If that is so, he says, that was so, how could judge God judge the world? So here Paul is saying, no, 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 God doesn't punish you now. God is now judging you and forgiving your sins because judgment will have to come first before punishment. So remember, uh, when, when, uh, when you hear someone says that, oh, we have a disaster here, we have AIDS epidemic here, it's God's punishment. Paul said, no, no, no. God is going to judge us first. Now, now is the time of repentance. Now is the time of grace. We can all come to God and receive forgiveness. There's no punishment yet. Punishment will come after the millennium, after the new Jerusalem comes down from heaven, after a thousand years, and the wicked will will rise up and try to conquer the new Jerusalem. And that is the time where the Bible says God will send fire. And that is the punishment. So, so we are not living in the time of punishment now. Right? So, so, so we are living in time of grace. So let's read the... Uh, Go to Wednesday's lesson and tell us the good news. All this is the good news. The good news is that we all can find forgiveness in what Jesus has done for us. You know, you and I can get pardon, mercy. You and I are living in a time of grace. After 1844, we are living in a time of judgment, but time of grace, time of forgiveness. After this judgment, then Jesus will come. So all you have to do is live a life of repentance. Walk closely with God. Stay away from sin. So here, the Bible is going to tell us in, in a slide number 14, how Jesus is going to save us. Let's read slide number 14. He said, having therefore, brethren, we are, Jesus calls all brethren, boldness to enter into the holiness by the blood of Jesus. You see, we can approach God now because Jesus has died for us and opened the way for us to come to God directly. And verse 20 said, by a new, by a new and living way, we're going to have a new life. Because what what Jesus has done for us, which he has consecrated for us to the veil. See, Jesus has opened the curtain of the veil. Remember when Jesus died, the veil of the of the temple was rent from top to bottom, exposing the most holy place. That symbol was that the priest is not our mediator now. Temple's function is finished. Jesus is now our high priest. And Jesus is mediating for us. And because Jesus died for us, Jesus lived a sinless life. Jesus overcame sin. Jesus overcame death. We do not have to die. All we have to do is come to him for forgiveness. And he has opened the way for us to God. So verse 21 in uh, slide 14 says, we have a high priest so we can draw near with a true heart 
with full assurance, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. It says even our hearts are evil. We have been washed by Jesus' blood. So it is what Jesus has done for us and his mediation that make us acceptable to God. So we have a, we, Jesus has opened a way and, and opened a new living way. What is this living way? We will have a new life when he comes. Right now, he has opened the way for us to God. So we are told that we should not go to any priest or any iman, iman, or any church. We can go to God through, directly through Jesus Christ. Jesus is now our high priest and our mediator. And this is what Jesus is doing for us after 1844. You see, Jesus' work fulfilled God's justice and mercy. God's justice is that sin causes death. We are all going to die. How does Jesus fulfill God's justice? He died for us, so we do not have to die. So Jesus' death fulfilled God's justice. And Jesus' intercession for us fulfilled God's mercy. Mercy is pardon, forgiveness. And it brings us reconciliation with God. So remember, uh, all we have to do is to come to Christ. Live a life of forgiveness. Walk in the law of God. And walk closely with God. Let me show you the last slide, slide number 15. Slide number 15 shows that Jesus is standing before the ark. What is the ark? The ark, on the top of the ark, has the mercy seat. That is where God's presence is. That is where God's mercy is. And on either side of the ark is two angels. They are covering and honoring the glory of God. So Jesus is pleading for us, making intercession for us after 1844, looking at all the books to prepare us for receiving the reward. And if you notice that uh, inside the ark, there's the Ten Commandments and that the mercy seat is higher than the Ten Commandments. So God's mercy is going to triumph over God's law. So if you ask for forgiveness, His mercy will overcome uh, the, the, the laws of God. The, he will give us forgiveness. Right. So you notice in revision that the 2,300 year prophecy and the 70 week prophecy are actually the prophecies of God telling Daniel, Daniel live here 600 years before Christ. God is telling Daniel this two prophecy. The first prophecy is about the 70 week prophecy, the coming of Jesus and the death of Jesus to save us from our sin. And the second prophecy, the 2300 day prophecy is telling us here, Jesus is, after he died for us, he's mediating for us. He's, he's presenting our sins before God to be blocked out, to make us acceptable to God. He's cleansing the sanctuary. So the two uh, prophecies of Daniel is actually, the prophecy is God telling Daniel about the mission of Jesus Christ. The life and death of Jesus Christ, the mediation of Jesus Christ, and the second the coming of Jesus Christ to come and save us. So let's read the last text, which is uh, slide number 17. Tells us that there is one God, one mediator, which is Jesus Christ, 
What did the mediator do? Verse 6, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. What is a ransom? Ransom is when you pay a price to get something. So here Jesus ransomed us. He paid a price. He paid his life so that we can have grace. He gave himself a ransom for us. So remember the two prophecy, the prophecy of Jesus first coming, dying for us, and the second prophecy of Jesus interceding for us before God to wash us, to block out our sins so that we will be ready to receive the reward after the cleansing of the temple. So what do you and I have to do? What do you and I have to do? Everything is already done for us by Jesus Christ. He died for us. He intercedes for us. He will come. All we have to do is to live a life of faith. We are saved by faith, saved by grace, by faith. We are live a life of faith. That means we have to believe and obey Christ. And we have to live a life of repentance so that our sins will be removed from our life. And then we will have to walk closely with God. The Bible says you want to pray for the Holy Spirit to write the laws of God in your heart. When you have the laws of God in your heart, you have the character of Jesus Christ, character of love. So all you have to do is live a life of faith, a life of repentance, a life transformed by the Holy Spirit to have the laws of God written in your heart. And then, obviously, you will be able to walk closely with God. So do not fear judgment because Jesus is interceding for us. So I hope you all remember these two prophecy. 70-week prophecy and 2,300-day prophecy. I thank you all for listening. I hope you enjoyed my... Thank you. <laughs>